Welcome into the Thunder Basketball Universe presented by Coop Aleworks. We are in studio. The Thunder is right smack in the middle of its prolonged four game homestand. They have already played two games, one against the Lakers and one against the Mavericks. That was on Sunday. And we've got a lot of stats, a lot of quotes from both of those matchups because a lot has happened since the last time we podcasted. So I say, Gallo, we just get right into it. Let's what do you do say? It. Yeah, sounds great. Okay, kick us off with you can say that again. Okay. Okay, mine is players start to hit their prime around 25 years old or so, and he's 23, and he's learning just like everybody else. That's Mark Dagnall. I know that. Yes, it's Mark, and I thought that this quote was particularly interesting because it was post-game after the loss to the Mavericks. Shea had a fine game, 18 mm -hmm. points, four rebounds, five assists, two blocks. It, it, he has set such a bar for himself that anything below this, like, unbelievable performance you're bound to get questions you know oh is he you know is he not playing quite as well these days da, 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 da. what was particularly fascinating about this paris was mark was sitting at the podium in the post-game press conference room and shea was standing right outside right waiting on his turn to talk to the media mark had no idea that shea was standing there mm -hmm. and mark gave this just incredible quote he waxed poetic about Shay and his you know potential and competitiveness and the fact that yes he has a lot of experience in comparison to maybe some rookies like Jeremiah Robinson Earl and Trey Mann but he's 23 mm -hmm. and he's still growing and he's still developing and he's being double teamed by opposing teams the third most out of anybody in the NBA so this is a guy that's still adjusting to a lot of these things and he's still about two years away from his prime so i think he was just reminding everybody like enjoy shay for where he is on this development curve and don't mm -hmm. voice these unreasonable expectations for perfection every single night out of him and the one thing i uh, he also pointed out that i uh, that stuck with me particularly was Shea's mentality throughout his entire career has been one of the things that sets him mm -hmm. apart, especially coming into this season. How many times have we heard from his teammates just how humble he is and how much that after anything that doesn't go the team's way, he's the first guy to look into the mirror and say, what could I have done better? Right. Mm -hmm. And so knowing that the team, yes, you know, Shea didn't have like his outstanding, you know, groundbreaking performance. It was a steady game for him. But he, the, the team lost. Right. And so you know that he's looking himself in the mirror and wondering what he could do better and going to work towards being better in the next game. That's just something that's been so consistent about Shea throughout his entire career. I love that you brought up the self-reflective nature of Shea. And really, that applies to so many of these young developing players on this team. And my backup choice for my <laughs> You Can Shea That Again quote was actually from Darius Baisley. And his quote was head coach Mark Dignall explained it that we weren't the hungrier team mm -hmm. against Dallas and basically said he kind of had this nice little pause and he said and I agree and for a, a kid that's 21 years old to have that level of self-reflection to have the ability to have the backbone yeah. enough to admit like hey we didn't have it we didn't fight hard enough we weren't hungry enough that takes such courage it would be so easy in this situation for a guy like Bayes, who's so young, who's had so much foisted upon his shoulders to point fingers or make excuses or complain. And uh, so what you just described about Shea, I think applies to a number of the guys on this team too. And it's why Thunder fans can feel so good yeah. about the future of the organization. And it's just that cultural mindset that the Thunder has, right? That the whole is greater than, than the sum of its parts. And so like whether or not you have a good night and the team loses, Josh Giddy had the same sort right. of quote after this game where, you know, that he was asked about being rookie of the month mm -hmm. or, you know, just about his shooting and performance overall. And he was like, look, I'd rather have zero, you know, numbers on my stat yeah. line and we win than have this outrageous, you know, performance and we lose. And right. that just speaks to the cultural mindset of this Thunder roster. That was after Josh's 10-7-7 game, his fourth 10-7-7 right. game of the season that was more than any Thunder rookie has ever done. And we're only, what, 25 games into yep. the year. So, <laughs> so uh, again, great to see some level-headed approaches from these Thunder guys. Okay, Absolutely. what was yours, Paris? All right, mine is... It's actually, I, I don't even remember when this quote happened, but I know <laughs> <laughs> I know it was at, in a practice. I think it was in the practice leading up to the Dallas game. Yeah, so Saturday. Saturday. Yeah. Okay, there we go. Before the shot comes off his hand, you either know it's going in or not. 
That's Jeremiah, right? It yeah. is. And yeah. I wanted to point out Jeremiah here because one thing that I have just been keeping my eye on with him, especially as he steps into this kind of regular center starting role, is he is oftentimes giving up a lot of size mm-hmm. at his position and yet seems to still find some effectiveness on the glass, particularly on the offensive glass. And I find this so interesting and it speaks to his IQ his you know, footwork and timing, because it, in this quote, he also went on to say, a lot of, a lot of the work happens beforehand, right, right. right? It's not like when the shot is in midair, then you start figuring out what you're going to do. It's like, no, as soon as that shot leaves his hand, I have to start making decisions because it, it, it's not going to be me out muscling somebody <laughs> necessarily, but it's got to be me being, uh, you know, in, it, being able to anticipate where I need to be on the on the boards. And, and the reason why the Thunder traded those two early second round picks to move up in the second round to get Jeremiah Robinson Earl is exactly some of the things that you're mm-hmm. explaining. He is a cerebral player, but he's also physical and tough yeah. and has the ability to impact the game on a number of different levels. And if you look at who he can be as a player in this league, there is a bit of a template out there for guys with mm-hmm. his sort of bruising ability at being undersized, yet quick feet, ability to transfer the ball from one side of the floor to the other. And what we've seen is the ability to knock down the three-point shot. You know, he's right. he's hovered in that top 10 among all rookies in three-point shooting this season so far. He's, he's not hit as many lately, but mm-hmm. you look at what he can, again, the Thunder's whole philosophy is let's look at what these guys can be, not right. what they are right now. And when you have that mindset and approach, you can easily see how Jeremiah can be an impact defender, rebounder, and just offensive contributor all the way around. I'm glad you brought up his offense because that was another thing that that has stuck out to me specifically is his three-point shooting. And we saw at the beginning of the season, he was, you know, knocking down those threes and being that really solid stretch five. And he brings a lot of versatility to the table. But obviously, you know, the shooting has been up and down for him as it's going to be for mm-hmm. like any rookie in the league. But he continues to shoot them. He continues to let them fire and, and, and let them fly. And for me, that speaks a lot to his mentality as well. He's very even keeled. He doesn't seem to get rattled a lot in terms of his confidence. And he knows that, you know, I still have to shoot this shot in order to be, you know, effective out here on the floor. If I stop shooting him effectively, I'm taking, you know, a a big option from my team. You know, bigs don't, don't feel like they have to come out and guard me. And now, you know. Shea's getting triple teamed in the paint. <laughs> and you're freezing the offense, too. Exactly. I mean, you completely bog down the offense if you don't take that shot. And right. so it's really interesting to watch the like the arc of Jeremiah's season. And I would yeah. encourage Thunder fans to just like be in it with these guys as they go through these peaks and valleys because his trajectory right now is kind of in a different zone than Trey Mann's is, for example. So like Jeremiah like burst onto the sp- scene and he played great right mm-hmm. out of the gates. Teams are starting to adjust to him a little bit. They've got a lot of tape on him now. Trey was sort of the opposite. He was sort of struggling to like figure out exactly what his space looked like on the right. floor, how to get his shots. Then he bursts out the last maybe half dozen to 10 games or so. He goes for a career high, 19 points against the Lakers, monster one-handed monster. dunk. Um, and, and so we're seeing him kind of have this like nice little ascension. Just don't don't get it confused that he is going to have another one of these dips again, but, but Mm -hmm. just continue to track them and and be appreciative of the work that's going in to work his way through those. Just like Jeremiah is going to work his way through that. This one too. The key phrase here to what you're saying is development is Mm -hmm. not linear for anybody. And that goes for the rookies, but it also goes for third and fourth year players on this team as well. They're going to be ups and downs. They're going to be peaks and valleys, but as long as you, you know, take those, those long-term views of these guys and what the trajectory looks like overall these guys are these guys are moving up and developing at a good rate that's right okay shall we go into name that dude yes please because yours is uh (laughs) confusing (laughs) to say the least yes (laughs) so uh help me name that dude gallo yeah okay so my name that dude is 12 players and the dude is Mark Dagnall because <laughs> he played sense. he played 12 players against the Dallas Mavericks. He actually played 13 players against the the Los Angeles Lakers. Wow. And that's not typical for an NBA rotation. Mm-hmm. You know, you're normally getting 9, 10 guys and um, the reason I picked out the Mavericks one is because it wasn't like he, you know, chucked a bunch of guys in there 
for the last couple minutes of the game. Right. Like, you know, in, in the Lakers game, he threw Teo Maladon out there for the last five minutes of the game. And that actually proved to be a really great opportunity for Teo. Mark said, you know, he was shot out of a cannon right. on that one. Right. And playing those five minutes with the tenacity that he did is such a great sign that Teo is taking those minutes seriously and responsibly. Against Dallas, the Thunder was really struggling mm-hmm. to find their footing, find a grip mm-hmm. on the game. And so something for you all to track and for us to track as the season goes on is just understanding that Mark is going to try to just grab and see like, okay, if so-and-so doesn't have it going tonight, if we don't quite have it going, if we feel like, hey, maybe we need some more spacing, we might throw Ty Jerome out there. If we feel like we need a little bit of like verve and punch in the backcourt, maybe it's Ty Jerome. I mean, sorry, maybe it's Teo Maladon. If we need some rebounding and energy, it's Isaiah Ruby. Like, there's so many different guys that he can throw out there, and all of them have to be ready, and we should be ready too. That's the theme of this yeah. Thunder roster is readiness. How many times have we just brought that up throughout this season? Yeah. This Thunder second unit, and it's really less about like the first unit and second unit, mm-hmm. and it's more of just about like the guys on the roster right. and whether your number is going to be called because how. Teo Maladon, he has, or Ty Jerome has logged to start this season. Yep. Trey Mann has logged to start this season. Isaiah Roby has logged to start this season. They all have opportunities throughout the season. It it can happen at any yeah. moment. And so it's just really important for them to stay ready and, st- and you know, n- know that their number could be called at any moment. And one anecdote for this that I love is when Trey Mann talked about Isaiah Roby mm-hmm. on the bench. Isaiah Roby. When he is, if he doesn't know whether or not he's going to be in the lineup, you would think that he is going to be the next guy off right, the bench right. with how laser focused he is and what he knows about the game and the opponent at hand. He's ready to go, ready to step in. And that has paid off for him when the team needs him. That's right. And you look at each one of these guys and that is their, that's their job. That's something that Ty Jerome always yes. talks about. It's like, mm-hmm. that's the job. That's being a professional. And so having that mindset, very critical because I think Teo is the perfect example of this. You know, he was playing with the blue. Mm-hmm. He went and scrimmaged with the blue. Uh, and he's getting these this, these little jolts of playing time. Mm-hmm. And then when Lou Dort goes down with a sprained ankle against Dallas, right. he gets thrust in and plays 13 minutes um, in that second half and starts the second half of that game. If he's not being shot out of a cannon the way that he was in the last five minutes of the Lakers game, who knows whether it's him that gets that opportunity to start the second half. Those minutes matter. They all matter. Anytime you step onto the floor, eyes are on you, and there's evaluation happening at right. that time. So making the most of it, that's big for them, but it's also the readiness factor, and and these guys know that. Okay. All right. Who's yours? I mean, you should know who this yeah, is. Yeah, I for, saw it on the run <laughs> for the for the For the listeners and for the viewers. My stat line is eight points in two minutes. <laughs> That's Mike Mascala. 120 seconds. <laughs> eight points. It's not quite Reggie Miller's eight points in, what was it? Six? Yeah. It yeah, was something yeah, absurd. Yeah, but this is yeah. also absurd. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, remember, I remember looking down, and this was, in the da- this was in the Dallas game. Yeah, that's right, yeah. And first quarter, I believe... Thunder's doing a pretty good job. You know, Dallas shot out of the gates. Like, all seven of their points were second chance points, and they got up to a 7-0 lead. And the Thunder had to kind of rally back and shake shake off that slow start. And they got it from a lot of different guys. I think, you know, Lou Dort knocked down a couple threes. Shea Gildas-Alexander had a couple of back-to-back and ones. But then, you know, Mike Muscala was just inserted into yeah. the game for a couple of minutes and <laughs> just dropped eight points straight. I The thing that I don't understand about Mike is, like, the first – when I first step onto a basketball court and I touch the ball for the first time, like that day, it, who knows where that ball is going to go? No, there's no. It dying. could break the backboard. <laughs> it, I mean, it could miss by five feet. Like it could go into the second it row. It takes a little bit of time to like get yourself warm. He comes in and he might not have even run up and down the floor one time, and he's got the ball in his hands and is shooting and making a three. Yeah, ridiculous. It, it's yeah. absurd. But this is why Coach Dagnall is so it was. Committed to bringing him off the bench mm-hmm. because he knew that Mike has this capability and he's a great example. Why he's such a great example to everybody else on this roster, just in terms of again the readiness, the professionalism. There is probably no better example than Mike Mascala, who it, literally can just turn it on at at a moment's notice. And 
here's the other thing. We'll talk about this a little bit later in the podcast as well. But in the Toronto game, we we podcasted about this. We talked about this in our last mm-hmm. podcast. But his game winner, before he knocked down that shot, he was one for five from yeah. the three point line. Yeah. So it's the mat it's it's the No memory. No memory. It just next play. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I don't know if any of you guys watch Ted Lasso. I know Nick Gallo doesn't watch Ted Lasso. I need to. I just haven't done it yet. Sorry. One of my favorite Sorry, quotes. Sorry, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> for those who do, yeah. you're gonna appreciate this. One of my favorite quotes from that show is be a goldfish you know why a goldfish is the happiest animal on earth it has a five second memory yeah okay there you go be a goldfish that's pretty good i like that <laughs> yeah. that's pretty good i'm gonna have to watch the show you have to yeah. now yeah i'm gonna check in with you after this off season make sure you've watched it <laughs> and i know this is something that we've talked about before but there's a reason why the best role players and bench role players in the nba are usually veterans mm. because they've developed this muscle memory over the course of time. They've honed the professionalism to be ready, to be able to go in and take shots. They've also entered a stage of their career where they kind of understand who they are as players, not only, you know, what they do on the floor that is, you know, their top skill, but also kind of where they are in the pecking order of like Mm -hmm. the NBA landscape. And so Mike has like a really good sense of who he is as a player, how Mm -hmm. he fits into the center team, how he fits into the league. Who knows when the next like iteration of, primetime competitive Thunder team is going to be, whether Mike Muscala is going to be on that squad when this when this organization is competing again in the playoffs and um, you know trying to go for Western Conference Finals and that kind of thing. But what Mike is doing right now, if he's not going to be a part of that long term, is he's training the guys who might be someday. The Trey Manns, the, the Jeremiah Robinson Earls, the second round picks, the late first round picks, the Darius Baisley, Baisleys who have said that they look up to Mike. Mm-hmm. He is training these guys that years down the line, when this team is ready to really rock, those players will have an understanding of what it takes to come off the bench and be like killers off the bench. Talk about being shot out of a cannon. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that was that was incredible. And the fact that, you know, six of those points, two three-pointers, and then the other one was just like being in the right spot under yeah. the rim, you know, assisted layup, just Excellent, nice, excellent efficiency. Nice, by Mike dex- nice dexterity by Muscala on that yeah. shot, on that shot pass by Poku. <laughs> Poku <laughs> rose up for a three and then bailed out of it the last second and made a nice little dish down low to, to Muscala. It was good stuff. Always ready, that Mike Muscala. Right. <laughs> All right, don't go anywhere. We'll be right back after this break. Coop L Works is the proud sponsor of Thunder Basketball Universe. Brewers of the fan favorites F5 IPA and 99 Calorie Ice Chest IPA. You'll find those and many more Coop beers at retailers across Oklahoma. Learn more at CoopLWorks.com. Well, we've got a special segment of today's podcast for you. We were able to catch up with the one and only Mike Muscala. We were just talking about him. We caught up with him after practice at the Thunder Ion today. Here's that interview. We are joined by the one and only Mike Muscala Muskie, who's here with us right now. He's a regular friend of the pod at this point. I mean, I, I third really, or fourth time I third think or we've had you on, on the yeah, podcast. Yeah. yeah, I think third. Okay. Nice. Well, there you go. Yeah. A regular friend of the pod at this point. So, Mike, before we jump into anything, we've got five rapid fire questions for you. All right, let's our, do it. our starting five. Yeah. So, let's kick things off. Gallo, you want to go first? Sure. All right, you got the first one. Yep. Your your favorite nickname, Muskie, which I know a lot of guys call you, or Moose, that I know a, fan, a lot of fans call you. You have a preference. Uh, I'll take Muskie. Okay. Okay. All right. Nice. Easy go-to. Well, if you could watch one movie for the rest of your life, only one. What Anchorman. Movie? That was such a fast wow. answer. Who I knows? couldn't even finish Amazing. the sentence. Anchorman. The first one. Yes. Okay. okay. Second one's underrated, too. But. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, stay classy. I like it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, like, on the Thunder, who's your news team that you have to assemble? Ooh. Like, who's... Who, <laughs> you who, who are you? Who a are you Thunder morning yeah. show. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, Champ is... Uh... <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Champ, I'll say, is... Uh... Roby. Uh, we'll say uh, <laughs> Brian Fantana is uh, Kenrich. <laughs> and... Uh... Veronica, <laughs> <laughs> who's Veronica Cornerstone? And I'm not gonna say Brick. I'm not gonna say Brick. Yeah, yeah. So we're just gonna yeah, move we'll, on. We'll, okay, we'll, okay. Move, we'll okay. move right along. Okay. Like <laughs> um, okay. Uh, favorite favorite musician. Oh, favorite musician. Uh, oof. I'll say Drake. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, nice. yeah, he was in the building the other night too. Yeah. Right now. That was a great surprise. Yeah. That, that was fun. Was really, really fun. Teammates, 
you would have with you, sorry, one teammate you would have with you in a zombie apocalypse? <laughs> um, I'd, say t- I'd say tie. Ooh, okay. oh, that's a great yeah. All right. choice. Yeah. All right. Wait, can, wait, wait. Smart, before we go to the last question, yeah. can, can you explain that one? Yeah, he's smart. Oh, yeah, that's fair. Resourceful. Yeah, yeah that's nice. a really good choice. Okay. Okay. You made some a little splash with your uh, your Yellowstone shirt the other night walking into the building. Yep. Paris and I have not seen that show. Oh, you haven't? Can yeah. you explain Yellowstone? Why we should watch? Yes. Yeah. It's, uh, it's about a family in Montana. Uh, Kevin Costner is the dad. It's very well cast. Uh, he's got some children in it that are, you know, grown adults, and it talks about their family dynamics and, you know, competing businesses and other landowners in the area that are trying to buy the land, um, trying to influence, you know, the politics of the region, and um, it's just got a really well you know, written plot. Mm-hmm. Um, and the drama is real. Uh, that's beautiful scenery. So like you'll put cool. it on and you'll just see beautiful um, landscapes in it and uh, just a good family show. So, and it's got a lot of, you know, just exciting things. Like it's, it's pretty intense too. It's cool that you mentioned the family side of it. I, I often think like, you know, there's the plot of some of these like prestige TV shows, but ultimately a lot of times they boil down to like the the dynamics of the family. And like I think of Mad Men and I think of The Sopranos, like exactly. those shows seem to be about maybe something else. But at the end of the day, what's drawing people is like that connection that, that they're drawing between the members of the family and how that dynamic shakes out. Exactly. The, the writer... Um... I think the creator of the show, Taylor Sheridan is his name, I uh-huh. believe. Uh, and he's also doing an, another show on Paramount, 1883, I think it's called. But there was an excerpt from, I was watching the most recent episode last night, and there was a, he was talking about you know his writing process and kind of like yeah. what you were saying. He's saying, you know, this is, like he, he owns one of the ranches um, that Whoa. in Texas that they've filmed at for this recent season. Cool. A guy gets sent there to work on it. He's, he's just saying that, you know, I want this is I want this to be real because like I kind of live this life wow. and I'm around people that do kind of live this life and so he said like I feel like the best drama is the you know is is real stuff that right. it feels like you know we go through this and you're not having to make stuff up. Wow, yeah. that's crazy. And that's cool. it's funny that you mentioned it was 1883 or 1833 the the, the new sh- show that's about I mean, to come out. I don't remember out. exactly what year but something like that. Yeah, yeah, apparently it's like the prequel to Yellowstone exactly. which will be really really cool to see. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's nice. awesome. Yeah. Okay, well now I now I feel like we got to watch Yellowstone. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Put it on the list. You won't Mike regret giving it. us yeah. homework. <laughs> All right, I appreciate that. There's a lot of long flights coming up in January. <laughs> this is true. Yeah. Yeah. This is true. Well, Mike, one thing we have to talk to you about, just just top of mind for both of us, is obviously you have a, a, an incredible role on this team just as a veteran but one thing that stands out in all of it is just your readiness and when any time you step on the floor it seems like you're ready to go and that was so evident in this last game uh, against Dallas where you stepped onto the floor two minutes and you had eight points it was just like this crazy efficiency but that's not the first time that we've seen something like that from you just not just the season but like obviously in your time with the Thunder We've, I feel like we've talked about it just so much about your professionalism and poise. But one thing that we just have to know is just like what it takes to be able to just step out on the floor and be as efficient as you were, just like you were in Dallas. And I mean, knock down threes as soon as you step in the game. <laughs> I mean, it's easy when you're playing with good passers like we have. Mm-hmm. And Coach Mark calls up some good plays and, you know, you find yourself open. I didn't score the rest of the game after that. And that's something that I'm, you know, kind of trying to work on myself is just being aggressive throughout the game. Mm-hmm. You know, I think that, uh, like I said, you, when you play with good passers and, uh, you know, good creators, like you got Shea out there, who's, you know, drawing so much attention to the defense and he's a willing passer. You're going to find yourself in open spots to shoot threes. And um, that's something I'm confident in. But, you know, I think the challenge for myself and, and the rest of us is to, you know, to find ways to, to bring our aggressiveness into the game and kind of create some things on offense. We talked about that in film today. Um, when you're not getting, you know, open looks per se, because mm-hmm. you know it's NBA, there's going to be good defense, and so you're not always going to be able to get those open looks. And how can you 
how can you find ways to impact the game? You know, maybe getting some more, more offensive rebounds or pushing in transition, giving us uh, some more opportunities to get easier buckets. But you have to work for those easy buckets, right. you know. So um, that's something that I think we can improve on, me included. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned your connection with Shea because we'd be remiss if we didn't ask you about the, the game winner in Toronto. Shea drives downhill, gets triple teamed. I don't know if you saw the photo that we posted on uh, Thunder's <laughs> social media account of Shea. He has the ball. He's triple teamed. He kind of has this, like, look on his face of, of maybe a little bit of distress or not sure what he's going to do. And then the next photo is taken a millisecond later. The ball is out of his hands, and he's looking at you. And he's this massive smile on his face because he sees <laughs> how wide open you are. Yeah. Okay. So <laughs> we'll, we'll have to send it your way. Okay. But anyway, so yeah, just, <laughs> just, like, thinking about that moment as you saw the play unravel and and, and open up, what, what was going through your head? It was a good play drawn up by Mark. Um Earlier in the year, we played <clears throat> the Clippers uh, in L.A., and he drew up a similar play. And um, I didn't like how I how I acted on that play or what I did. Uh, and I feel like this play, he you know, he gave us some good opportunities, like setting up Lou for a back cut. Mm-hmm. Um, and then if that wasn't there, you know, allowing to allowing to play pick and roll, pick and pop with Shea. So it was a good play call, and I feel like uh, it was just well executed, and, and Shea, you know, took his time in there. Uh, and I was, you know, in the back of my mind kind of hoping that that shot would open up, but you have to kind of go through the steps to make that happen first. It's it's fascinating to hear you say that about the, the Clippers situation because I think a lot of fans in particular look at you as like, well, Mike, Mike does all the right things on the floor. How could he ever be, like, upset with how he approached the situation. I think, I mean, kind of goes to show like player development goes on a, f- throughout your entire career. For right? sure. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's what's fun about the game. If you can try to embrace that, you know, there's been times in my career where it's been stressful to me or it's been like daunting because there's just so, there's so many plays throughout the game, but I feel like Mark, uh, you know, he embodies just a constant learning and growth you know, kind of approach to the game. And when you can look at it from that standpoint, it feels kind of, you know, just like how you can approach life in a way, you know, it's like just try to find ways to improve. Um, you know, I think watching film is a, is a great way to do that. So, you know, I think it's good that we do that as a team and try to continue to emphasize that to the younger guys. Cause I, I think that's something that you know, as you get older and play a little more, you, you really recognize how much film can help just watching yourself out there. Yeah, and I'm curious now that you bring this up because it seems, you know, after every press conference and game that we get to talk to, you're very self-reflective. I mean, even just in this conversation so far, just being able to look inward and see what you could do better. Where have you felt yourself be able to grow just this season alone? Um, I'm, I th- Maybe just uh, having some more fun with it. Derek <laughs> Favors talks about that before almost every game. Let me go through the little handshakes and just says have some fun you know Uh have fun with it and I think that's a good reminder because yeah I mean I think I'm I'm quite self-reflective by nature but it's like at the end of the day it's a game right you know and it's and um and so you should have fun with it and you know while it's but it's fun to compete and it's fun to play hard too you know and I think that's some some values that uh you know I hope that you know, we can continue to build here because uh, I feel like, you know, win or lose, if you felt like you went out and you competed and you gave it your best, you can live with those results. But, you know, it's a little different than just having fun and, and being carefree. It seems like such a, a great balance to strike, and you seem to do it so well where you're thinking in between games, but once you're on the floor, you're not thinking anymore. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and it seems like that's, as many young players come into the league, that's something that they're like striving to have more consistency on is not be out there thinking and just be out there reacting and having fun. For sure. I mean, it's got to be a balance, you know? It's like sometimes it might be a little bit too much one way or the other, but it's, yeah, it's definitely got to be both, and that's a good point. Uh, Dave Bliss, one of our uh, assistants who's you know, coached us for a few games there on the road, you know, he's done such a good job this year um, with with game plans and, and our defense. And before one of the games uh, this year, he – had a quote from a from a jazz musician. I forget exactly who it was, but I think he said he saw him play in New York City when he was coaching the Knicks, and he said uh, something along the lines. I'm not. I don't remember exactly what it was, but you know, someone asked him, "How'd you get so good at playing your instrument or what whatever he was playing?" And 
he said a lot of practice, 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 practice. But then once it's showtime, just letting it wail cool. and just playing. You yeah. know, and that kind of stuck with me. It's mm-hmm. like once you get in there, just start, just play, and then you can always watch the film or whatever later. Yeah. It's yeah. about you know trusting the work that you put in on the front end and you know letting it go and have some fun. Just yeah. letting it go for sure. All right, I had one more topic before we let you go. A little something fun to to end with, and you know, Paris and I are so like grateful to be back and traveling with the team all of last year. You know, we were calling the games from the stands and paycom center while you guys were all on the road. And That's I know I, I, I got to imagine <laughs> with, with, uh, you know, COVID being what it was last year compared to what it is now, the, the whole experience of traveling is much more enjoyable. And, um, you're, you're just so experienced. I, I wanted to ask you, you know, we, we often talk about, you know, the different cities that we get to go to, the hotels we stay at, the arenas, who has the best food in the arenas, all that kind of stuff. What are some of the things that the players kind of banter about, um, you know, when you when you go from city to city and, you know, sometimes you're you're like maybe in a rut or in whatever, but like the things about each new city that can kind of bring you a little bit of, of life or, or jolt. Yeah, I, mean, I think, uh, I mean, like shopping for a lot of guys or yeah. nightlife or, you know, restaurants are, are big things. So, um, you know, in cities where guys feel like they can, you know, get out um, on an on an off day, or if like if we're spending an extra day there, or if we get in the night before, and you know they might have some friends. So I feel like just kind of like the social aspect of it, um, and th- the shopping are big things. Um, the weather is obviously a, a big thing too. Just like that's kind of I mean, being able to, you know, if you go to Miami or LA or something, and but I mean here we're blessed in Oklahoma, and especially this this year, like yeah. the weather. Mm-hmm. I enjoy coming home for that <laughs> right, reason. Right. You know, like we were just yeah. in Toronto, yeah. and it was like twenty degrees or whatever it was, it's snowing, it's yeah. snowing, and then we landed back here and it was like seventy. Right, we played nine holes of golf. It was like, <laughs> this is great. Like so, I'm grateful for that. But uh, I mean, yeah, hotels are obviously uh, uh-huh. a big uh-huh. one in that. Uh, I'm trying to remember. Oh, like in Houston. Like that new post oak hotel yeah. that they put in. That's yeah. crazy. Love that. And that's like, like there's so many examples of hotels. I talk with Dave Bliss about this too sometimes, where it's like, I would never be staying at this hotel if it wasn't for basketball. Exactly. If it wasn't for being the yes. NBA. 100%. And yeah. That's what we become so grateful for as the years go on. Because I'm never be staying at the post oak in Houston. If, yes. if it wasn't for playing a basketball game. And so that's fun. Of all of the really great hotels that we stay at, like the worst hotel that we stay at would not be one that we would have ever stayed at, you know? Like, like, <laughs> yeah. And, you know, yeah. same with the flights. The longest flight is way more enjoyable than any commercial one. So what, one other thing I did want to ask you about, just because you've, you've been in a league, you've seen a lot of different buildings. We as media no longer get to go into the locker rooms, but it's kind of one of those, like, home court advantage thing sometimes for opposing teams, like what the state of the visiting team's locker room is. You hear all these stories about, you know, back in the day in the Boston Garden, they would like turn the temperature down in the locker room to frigid, you yeah. know. So what are what are some of your like takeaways of like the the locker room situation, the visiting locker room situation around the league? Yeah, I um, the Atlanta Hawks uh, have now a very nice visiting locker room. Very nice. Um and now, in terms of the worst right now, Staples Center is not, tight. not it's pretty tight. Yeah. Um, like we were talking about, the, the <laughs> Sacramento Kings used to be the worst by far. They it had so bad. They had like six foot ceilings in certain portions of that locker room. It was like, like 12 like, lockers. Yeah. You had to like share oh, a locker man. with somebody, I swear. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, when you see these pushes for the brand new arenas, I, I got to imagine the, the players around the league are very happy with, with those developments. <laughs> for sure. Yeah. yeah. The Kings also have a nice, uh, I mean, a lot yeah. of the visiting locker rooms have improved for yeah. sure with the new arenas, like you said. This is a random question, but it, and it might not even affect you know players because you guys kind of like file into the locker room like one one behind the other. But I know for me, like I still am getting used to where to go. Like when it comes to visiting team locker rooms, I imagine that like you're probably used to it at this point being in the league. But has like rookies being young, like was that something that ever was just like you know where do I go? Where like where, where, where do I go? Yeah, yeah. yeah for sure. And uh, now you just gotta kind of go with your with your gut i feel like over the years <laughs> like, like we were in like one example we were in toronto yeah, recently for the yeah, game yeah, yeah. and we had a practice day and uh and um because like still sometimes i don't really know where i'm going when i go yeah, in, yeah. like the security people will just be kind of standing there and they won't like tell you a direction right. be, like, one right. or the other. you just gotta try to trust your gut yeah yeah so we were in uh yeah. we we're in like the the raptors practice in oh. their arena yes yep. yeah and like yep. uh 
then to get to their practice facility, it's on like the concourse third level of the arena. Yes. So you enter in through the garage and that's on like L1 or whatever it is. And we get in the elevator and like I, you know, we go in the elevator and I asked, I think Poku, I was like, what do the security man say? Like what floor? And he's like, oh, he didn't tell me. And there's like these four different options. I, was like, I feel like it's three. <laughs> I just clicked it and we got off and then like when we get off and I think Kobe was there. We were, like, <laughs> we're like, we're on the third floor. This is not it. We're on the concourse level. I was like, I'm telling you, this is where it is. And like we were, we found it you on the third floor. That. I was like, all right. <laughs> it's not obvious when no, you get no, up there no. like where you're supposed to go. You got to yeah. trust that yeah. veteran intuition. <laughs> and, yeah. yeah. Sometimes yeah. you're wildly wrong. Like I've been <laughs> wild, just going the wrong way down the hallway. Way, but you just gotta go with confidence yeah, man. yeah i guess confidence. something those, like that those road it, practices are fun sometimes because they can be in the most random places like i remember early on in in my career we used to practice at santa monica high school in in los angeles yeah when we i used there. to practice there too guys would walk from the hotel to the high school gym you know stuff would be the, the rafters would be falling apart and right. like but you're in there and it's just like for the love of the game you know we yeah. practice at ucla now like mm. some of these these road practices can be a little I don't know, bring you back to your roots a little bit. For sure. It's fun, yeah. though. I'm like in, in those big cities when you practice in a kind of a, like a high school or something. Like you said, it brings you back to your roots in a way and uh, puts you in a little different setting. Yeah, it's kind of fun. A little, yeah. a little mental reset, yeah. I feel like, too, because once you're in the same spot, you know, practicing, I, mean, I imagine being in the Thunder Ion, it's nice, you know, being home. But also, like, you get into a little bit of a groove and a rhythm mentally of just being in the same place, knowing where you need to go and what baseline, which, what, you know, basket I need to shoot on. I don't know. I feel like it's nice to just have a little bit of a reprieve in that in that regard. 100%. There was one infamous Thunder practice on the road where the power went out, <sighs> and there was just enough light from, like, the emergency lighting <laughs> that, and it was kind of this beautiful moment, like, the whole team just like, let's just keep it rolling. We're gonna practice in the dark, That's and cool. like it was, it was this kind of intense. Like yeah. you have no idea whether you can see what you need to see to make plays, but again, <laughs> kind of like playing off that intuition and and um, and everything. It was it sounds kind of dangerous. It was but also like, like could yeah. be a tactic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, if you can if you can yeah. make a shot in the dark, you can <laughs> right. make a shot with the lights on. <laughs> really it's like Bane, born in the dark. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> exactly. Well, the right. Thunder won't have many games on the road in the coming days. As a matter of fact. This is this is an interesting dynamic for you guys because it's one game in five nights, like wow. you know two get two days off right now and then two days after this New Orleans game. Just want to throw this your way. How nice is that? What is that like for you guys? That's very rare this season. It is, yeah. No, it's nice. Uh, it let me do some Christmas shopping yesterday. <laughs> there you go. I'll do a little more today. So uh, yeah, it's great. That's awesome. Yeah, gotta get our Christmas shopping Definitely. into at this yeah. point. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, Mike, thank you so much for taking the time again to be on the podcast. It's always so much fun having you great, on the pod. Great to chat with you, man. Yeah, thanks yeah, for so having me. Fun. Great questions as always. I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah. Always yeah. fun. And uh, we'll catch you next time. Sounds good. All right. Thanks, Mike. All right. We'll take a quick break and we'll be back right after this. It is now that amazing point in the podcast where we want to bless your timeline. And how about this? We have got two blessings. A double blessing. A double yeah. blessing. We're double dipping on the blessings today. And the first one was incredible. We're going to go in an order of chronolo chronological right. order here. But this one was in incredible at the Lakers game on Friday. Right. So two of the three known living survivors of the 1921 Tulsa race massacre came down to Paycom Center to watch their very first NBA game, the Thunder versus the Lakers. Um, it was so amazing as Malcolm, our in arena MC, announced them to the Paycom Center crowd. They received a full crowd standing ovation. It was such a powerful moment. Paris, you did a, a perfect hit on it during the Valley Sports Oklahoma game broadcast. But just, you know, can you put into context a little bit more like, what this moment was for the, these two. I, I still get chills thinking about right. it because, first of all, this was their first ever NBA game. Never too late to come down to Paycom Center, right. first things first. Second of all, so this past summer marked the 100-year anniversary of the Tulsa Race Massacre. That this, this story, this history has long been you know covered up, essentially, and right. n wasn't common knowledge, but it was one of the most violent acts of racial violence in, in American history. And these two, uh, these three living survivors have 
just been such courageous voices and being able, they even went up to, you know, Washington, D.C. Right. to go, you know, testify, testify in yeah. front of Congress, gave it absolutely emotional, powerful speeches up there. And I had the honor and absolute privilege of being able to interview one of those survivors. And that was Mother Fletcher. Her name is Viola Ford Fletcher, 107 years old. Amazing. Absolutely incredible woman. And one of the things that I learned from that interview one, she was obviously about six, seven years old when, when the massacre happened, and it took so much from her family. And she said to this day, there are still like lasting impacts mm -hmm. of that, you know, being able to go to sleep at night and, you know, just loud noises still rattle her at this age. And so you, you see the strength, you see the courage, you, you just see the, the incredible, you know, characteristics of these, uh, of these survivors. And so for them to be able to come to the game enjoy a night where they are celebrated, where they get to see a, a awesome basketball game, you know, the, the Thunder, Shea Gildas Alexander, you know, the Lakers, LeBron James, just going at it, having a good time. And then they got to come down onto the floor right. after the game and take a picture. And they were sporting their very own Thunder jerseys with their names on the back. And so it was an incredible moment inside of the arena. I, still, to, to get chills thinking about it. One crucial detail, Paris. Yeah. Mother Fletcher's brother yes Hughes Van Ellis was the other living survivor that yes. was in Paycom Center that night he is 100 years old yes and so just the fact that this brother and sister mm -hmm. are first of all still living and kicking and fighting and survive you know it, yeah. it's incredible and for them to be doing these types of things together to be going to Washington and to to coming to NBA games and really enjoying it and having the verve and vigor I mean you saw you saw uh, Hughes Van Ellis give like a nice little fist pump he when, was uh, having he was a blast. Yeah. Yeah, you so. could even before the game, they were like playing music. You could see him up there dancing right. and like <laughs> having a good time. I'm like, this is exactly what they deserve. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. A, a great time inside of Paycom Center. So it was great. It was an honor to have them inside of the arena on Friday. It, they said they want to come back. So, yeah. you know, doors always open for those three. So the other thing that blessed our timeline was – Somebody on the very opposite of the age spectrum, maybe not completely the opposite, but <laughs> yes. uh, a guy in his 20s named Pierre from France contacted me on social media and he said, hey, you know, I I'm, I'm flew all the way across the Atlantic to Oklahoma City to come to Paycom Center, to come to the game on Friday against the, the Lakers and on Sunday against the Mavericks. And he, he sent me this message on Saturday after he'd already seen one game and he said, you know, is there any way that I could just meet you in Paris and Chris Fisher and Michael Cage and the Bally Sports uh, broadcast crew. And I was just blown away oh that somebody goodness. would want to, you know, fly. He looked like he was in the stands, you know, by himself. So he, he mm -hmm. came all the way to America during COVID by himself, mm. had to go through, you know, rigorous testing protocols just to be able to come to a Thunder game. And it just made me once again, you know, realize how grateful I am to be a part of the NBA. The fact that we have the NBA in Oklahoma City, the fact that the Thunder exists for so many people is such a joy. And so um, to see that reinforced and to see the look on his face um, when he came down and, and kind of stood right behind press row and was able to, to chit chat with us for a little while and, you know, be right na down close to the court. That was a lot of fun. So and Pierre, thank you so much. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much, Pierre, if you're listening and post that picture so that we can all reshare it. Yeah. Tag us in it. We want to yeah. see it. Absolutely. And I always find it so interesting, you know, people from France, I get curious if Teo feels this way as yeah. well. Hearing that my name is Paris, yeah. like just what, <laughs> what does that make you like? Is that weird for them? I don't know. Pierre didn't seem very phased by he it. He was like, oh, okay, <laughs> okay, that's fine. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> I guess it's just a normal name. But Pierre, it was great to meet you and so happy you were able to come all the way to Oklahoma City to enjoy a couple of games. We were so happy to meet you and take that picture. Right. So awesome. All right. Well, before we let you go, of course, we got to let you know what's on tap for the Thunder. That's our job here as reporters of this team. So first things first, the team, we're recording this on Tuesday, December 14th. The team plays tomorrow on Wednesday. It's their third out of their fourth home game of this series, of this yep. four-game homestand. And that's going to be against the New Orleans Pelicans for the second time this season. Yeah, the first meeting was down in the Big Easy. The Thunder mm -hmm. had a pretty solid lead for most of that game, had to fend off uh, the Pelicans there in that second half. Shea's 
cousin, Nikhil Alexander Walker, was the one that was really um, mm-hmm. putting the pressure on the Thunder, and Jonas Valanciunas had a big time game. So be sure to tune into that one on Wednesday. And then the Thunder takes on the LA Clippers on Saturday. So two more days off in between games between Wednesday and then that Saturday game at home. Don't give any one game in five night, you know, stretches in the NBA. You know, where were these days when we had the four games in five nights and the five and seven and all of that? <laughs> that no. would have been so nice. <laughs> Wouldn't have known what to do with all of that free time. I'll tell you that much. <laughs> Well, we are going to enjoy being here in Oklahoma City right before the holidays. It is going to be special. And so for all of you, come on down to Paycom Center and enjoy the game down here with all of us. No, things have gotten really festive here inside of Paycom Center. Those who have come to Thunder Games recently since the start of December, you know what I'm talking about. But if you don't, get yourself down here so you can see this and get in that, that Christmas spirit. It's a lot of fun. But until then, thank you so much for watching and listening. Be sure to like, rate, and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. If you're not watching us on YouTube, be sure to go there and check it out as well. Thank you so much to our producer, Matt Bishop. And until next time, thunder up and catch you later.